start streaming. Are we live? Is it live? It says offline. Someone let me know if we're live. I think we're live. I'm going to go live on all the devices here. We finally... Yep. Cool. Okay. We're live on all the devices now. We're on YouTube mainly, but we're also on Facebook. Cool. Okay. It says we're live. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mike Rosehart Show. Today we're going to talk about real estate investing, Q&A, and some personal finance questions that you guys bring to the table. I have no agenda. Yesterday, sorry, last week, I did one on private lending 101. And today, hey guys, today I'm going to do one on whatever you guys want to talk about. I just filmed a sick whiteboard video on the Burr investing method, the best real estate investing method that exists uh, on the planet, in my opinion, from a tax efficiency and maximizing your wealth perspective with the lowest amount of risk. So that'll be interesting to, to check out. And I'm gonna do some real examples on the burr because I've done the burr like 40 times, 50 times? Like 50, we've done like 50 burrs. Not a lot of people have done that many burrs. Um, so it's kind of cool to have practiced it enough times that I'm starting to, as they say, hone the craft and develop mastery over how to execute on the burr. This video is gonna be a high level on the burr, but uh, anyway, bring your questions, shoot them in the bottom. Hey guys on Facebook, hey everyone on YouTube, and hello everyone on Instagram. I have everyone here from all the different platforms. Someone let me know that I am live on YouTube. Yeah, it says live, Rusco says live. Okay, so you guys choose the platform. You can ask questions from any of the platforms. I'll try to jump back and forth and talk about them. Um, some really big announcements I can't wait to share. Can't share yet, I'm not allowed to. Some big real estate stuff happening. Um, a big merger potentially happening, acquisition on another business and I'm buying a business in Toronto, which is going to be fun. So for all my Toronto friends, I might be in Toronto a day a week in the beginning of getting that business established. It's already established, but in the beginning of the training period where we learn how the business is operating. So that'll be really fun for the people who are following around. Um, yeah, I guess bring your questions on. We'll do a quick episode today. If the questions are, you know, there's a lot of questions, then I'll try to stay as long as I can, but hopefully it's a quick episode today. I had uh, an all-nighter last night preparing for a big, important meeting today. And so, yeah, um, I apologize if I'm a bit tired. Let's go to Instagram first. We seem to have some good activity on there. Hey, everyone. Wow, there's a lot of people. See you guys all on there. Wave, wave. I'm waving back at you all, clicking the wave button. Um, okay, there's no questions except for this dumb one from my mentee. There are no dumb questions, but is God good? This has nothing to do with real estate investing, but is he good? I don't know. It's a deep question. Some might say he's a little twisted. Some of his visions of things. I don't know. Um, is there a higher power? Probably. I think so. There's a, uh, I can't think of it right now, but there's a line of thought around um, a lot of people believe in uh, I hear laughing in the background from Elise. She's probably watching me live right now. Um, there's this line of thought in this argument that I remember in my first year philosophy class in the university that was like, it makes no sense not to believe. Like you might as well believe in a higher power because if you're wrong, then, I'm sorry, so let, why would you want to believe in a higher power? You'd want to believe in a higher power because if you're right, then you get to go to heaven and have this great life and all this shit happens. If you're wrong, you might as well believe because if God didn't exist anyway, at least you lived a life where you followed some good principles and, and that sort of thing. So um, it makes sense to believe no matter what. Whether you are not sure if God exists or not, it makes more sense to believe because whether you're right or you're wrong, you're better off having believed that he existed because if you're wrong, you win. And if you're right, you win too. So you might as well believe in God. Um, that was a, yeah, I don't know why I went deep like that, but I did. So anyway, I can hear them laughing. I can hear the mentees in the background of the room just like throwing me bones, trying to, trying to screw with me. So next question, what's your take on selling houses wholesale as opposed to remodeling and flipping? So Nicholas, um, what do I think about wholesaling? It's really distracting. You guys are laughing in the room. I actually would prefer if like the four of you guys did not sit outside this room. It's actually really distracting. I'm just, anyway, they're, they're talking outside the room. You guys probably can't hear it on camera, but it's, it's really annoying for me because they're just, they're just trying to screw me up. But anyway, so selling houses. 
Wholesaling is the idea that you take a property under contract, you get it under contract, and then you assign it to someone else. A lot of people in the community right now are misunderstanding and thinking they're linking a seller of a property and a buyer and facilitating that trade. That will put you in jail. RICO has firm rules that you cannot act in the brokering of real estate transaction. You can not help two people write an offer. That's a real estate agent. You have to have a license to do that. You can put a property under contract yourself, go with the intention to buy and to close on yourself. People who are wholesaling are breaking a lot of rules. You gotta be very careful. If you're going in though with the intention to buy it yourself and then you decide not to and you assign that contract that's assigned with you, you sign the contract with the seller yourself and then you assign that contract, the right to that contract to someone else, that is okay, you can do that. Um, I can't necessarily do it as a real estate agent because if I do, I have to, well I can, but I, when I'm doing a private sale, I have to disclose all the comps, I have to basically do my fiduciary duty to represent the seller's best interest. Most wholesalers don't do that, it's a bit unethical, but that's the way that they get the houses for really good deals. I have to disclose and say, hey, I stand to make a profit on this deal, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so wholesaling. Should you wholesale? It's up to you. I have never actually technically wholesale. I never assigned a contract for money. That's crazy. I've like assigned a ton of deals, but when I assign them, I assign them to an investor for no fee, and then we, we partner on the, on the property. So I've actually never assigned a contract technically. Sorry, I've assigned contracts. I never assigned them for money technically, so I've never actually really uh, wholesaled per se but I have gone through the entire motions of wholesaling and bought a ton of private real estate. I think it makes more sense to burr than it does to flip. That was the second half of your question, I believe, was uh, what's your take on selling houses wholesale as opposed to remodeling and flipping? So the idea of wholetailing is this idea where I hear, heard it said, Luke is someone who's kind of popularized that in the network, that you basically buy the property, you do a quick little rehab, and you basically just sell it. Or you even just literally close on it yourself and then sell it again. And that's a great strategy I've seen done that uh, you can make more money than trying to sign the contract. Say the contract is $100,000 below market value and you assign it for a $10,000 wholesale fee, you're giving the investor $90,000. If you have the money or the resources to borrow the money, it makes more sense, I think, to take the capital and buy the property, borrow it from wherever you got it, and then sell the property immediately. So put it up in a hot market like today, you know, we're in a really hot market, eight days on market, seven to eight days on market in London. A property gets listed and it's sold in seven to eight days. That is really short time on market. That is really hot market. We're not seeing the price increases we were seeing before, but we're seeing a really hot market. So when stuff goes up, there's you know good demand to meet the supply. And so in this market right now, it doesn't make a little lot of sense to wholesale. It makes sense to just take them all down yourself. It's the reason like I, I probably wouldn't assign a deal right now. I'd probably just take it down myself because there's more profit in taking it down yourself. And so that's why I bring it to my investor network and we take it down as opposed to me trying to get rid of a property for a fee. It's just like an easier method. So I would say if you have the capital and you have the expertise, that's the big piece and you can actually execute on this. You should just take the deal down yourself. But uh, as always, if you do have a deal to sell me, I would love to take that deal on. Uh, sure, why not? That'd be cool. Okay. Um, thanks for that one, Elise. And the interruption. <laughs> I'm gonna go to YouTube now for a sec. Okay, so hey William, good to see you on. Mike, good to see you on. The best way to find off-market properties is property liens for a cash buyer. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that, there's lots of ways to find off-market deals. I've heard that's a decent way to do it. Austin, good to see you on. Would you prefer to trade higher ROI for a safer neighborhood or invest in a C or D neighborhood for greater ROI? So Austin, this is a tricky question and I've battled with it for a while. You asked me in 2014, 2015, 2016, my strategy was focused on A, class, a and like B class tenants in great areas. I had way less stress. So on one side, you might, you could have a property that's 2% rule. In the really bad areas of London and like Windsor and Sarnia, you get 2% rule properties. Properties that return 2% of the purchase price each month back to you. So that would mean you get your whole purchase price back, 100% of the cost of the property back in 50 months, a 2% rule property. That's before appreciation and anything else, just from you know rental gross rental income. Now these 2% property rule properties versus a 1% rule property, it's half as good from a rental income to price perspective in a A-class neighborhood. What I found, and this is anecdotal, and again, my experience with 50 or 60 properties, having managed a lot of that and talking with people who have properties in both neighborhoods, 
and my own portfolio, which started in only A and B neighborhoods and has now, as I scaled up my business in the last year, expanded to those C and D neighborhoods. And my thoughts are, are kind of, it depends. In some cases, I've seen the D-class properties underperform from a net cash flow perspective my A properties, despite having on the surface better cap rates. And here's why. So in the D and C class neighborhoods, what I ended up ha having happen was tenants would get bed bugs and roaches and they would fight you with the landlord tenant board. And like someone would literally, we had a, this happen with a giant window, like a six by nine window. Someone walking by took a rock and threw it through the window and smashed it. It was a $2,000 window. That's cash flow for three months. Mistake, buying in the wrong area. That's, that's it. We actually manage this property for an investor and we're not even partnered on this deal. It's actually a, like purely a property management contract. So I actually don't want to own anything on Hamilton Road in the core like Ham and Eggs area, Hamilton and Egerton area. You don't want to own right on Hamilton. It's a really bad area. It happens all the time. People just throw a brick through your window. That sucks. That costs you money. And you get those D class tenants, no matter like the best you're going to get on Hamilton Road in Egerton, like this is a rough area of London in that C class neighborhood is like a C plus tenant. The A tenants don't want to live there. Like the guy who's making $80,000 a year doesn't want to live next to the drug addict who's shooting up and getting stabbed, right? Like you just don't want to live there. And so it doesn't make sense to renovate the properties to A level because you're in a C neighborhood. So why would you put quartz in or stainless or make them nice? It doesn't make sense. You're over improving for the area. So it makes no sense. So you have to keep your properties kind of in like a B shape and do the slumlord thing. The slumlord thing can work. If you want to keep your properties up though, it's going to cost you a lot. Here's the thing I've noticed with the D class tenants. Austin, this is a great question. Actually, I'm really enjoying this one. The C and D tenants, they have a lot of drama in their life. Like for whatever reason, they're fighting with their ex or like they just lost their job and they're on the new job or they've just had some like drug issue or, you know, there's just so much drama in their lives. Like a lot of mental illness, a lot of substance abuse. I've just noticed that pattern with people who are extremely impoverished. They have that, it, it's just hard to make a go of it, right? With not a lot of money. And so you just, you associate with the wrong people. And anyway, when you have those kind of dramas, there, there's this like entitlement I don't know what to call it, but like an entitlement attitude. A lot of these tenants think the landlord has a duty to like help them with all of their problems. And so like, for instance, they sent their rent to their friend and their friend didn't pay them back. I don't have rent. So you have to chase them down. My point is this, the bad debt expense, really high on these C and D properties. I would double or triple it versus my A properties. So bad debt expense is when a tenant doesn't pay you back. Um, what about on uh, like repairs? When these tenants move out, they leave a lot of junk behind. So you gotta go and spend thousands of dollars to clean the units out, repaint them. You know, often they've damaged the floors. They have no respect for themselves often and no respect for your property, especially no respect for your property. And it's weird because the tenants want something to lose in the A-class neighborhood. They don't wanna scratch your floor. They're afraid they're gonna get in trouble. Or like, they don't wanna nick the wall. They'll like touch it up themselves because they're afraid that they'll lose, you know, some of their last month's rent or maybe they'll, you'll go after them because they have something to lose. When you have nothing to lose in the C or D neighborhood, in a CND tenant, you don't care. You scratch the wall, you're like, oh, well, good luck getting blood from a stone. I got no money. He ain't coming after me. I ain't got no job. So that's the whole, <laughs> that was a bad impression of a C or D class tenant from like down south or something. But Austin, I think that in my personal opinion, if I had like 10 properties, I would prefer all in the A neighborhood. If I had just a small portfolio, I don't want to be in the C or D neighborhood because the cost is much higher. And this depends on what you value your time at. But I think the deciding factor between C and D properties and A properties is what do you value your time at? If you value your time at under $30 an hour, which like that's 90% of Canada, pretty much 80% of Canada at least. So I would say 80% of Canadians are, should be cool with C or D class properties. But if you're valuing your time and your stress and your all that stuff at a, a rate higher than $30 an hour, don't buy C or D class properties. Wealthy people don't want those properties. Do you want to, like, I don't even want to associate with, you know, those kind of people doing drugs and have mental illness. They'll drag you into their problems. Oftentimes it's, it's very bad when they're calling you late at night over stupid things that are not even, some of the stupidest stories I could tell you guys. Like, you know, they got in a fight and they bang the faucet off and it's squirting water out. Like that doesn't happen in an A-class environment. Like the, someone doesn't get drunk and smash their head off a faucet and break the faucet. Like this kind of stuff doesn't happen in A-class properties where you can attract the best kind of tenant. You just can't attract that tenant in the C or D-class property. The A-class tenant is at work all day and they make, they got a lot of money. They don't have time for the drama. The person with no job on, you know, Ontario disability or welfare, 
they've got more time and they're in their house more and I don't know. So my thought is if you, the cash will have to be significantly higher in those bad neighborhoods to justify. I prefer location, location, location. I like to buy in the better neighborhoods more than I like um, buying in those, those C or D class neighborhoods. So all great stuff, all great questions here, Austin. I love that one. It got me uh, kind of pumped up there. So what I prefer, the, high, the answer to your question, would I prefer a higher ROI myself personally? I prefer a better neighborhood. That's me. I like that B neighborhood over that C or D neighborhood. I don't like the A because it's hard to get a deal in the A. If you can find a deal in the A neighborhood, power to you. A lot of the A neighborhoods don't cash flow. But if you can find it, which like this house, for instance, I live in right now, it's like nine bedrooms in it, I can make a cash flow 1% rule. And it's in an A, almost A plus neighborhood. And so that's a, that's a unicorn. If you can find that unicorn, my strategy was actually in Northwest London. I was buying in the best neighborhoods. And I was finding like semis and, dupl and duplexing properties and putting a lot of bedrooms in and cash flowing even in the good neighborhoods. The best part was I was attracting good quality tenants. I didn't have those, those rougher tenants. In Northwest London, for instance, it's a far walk to collect your government pogey check. You live in East London, it's nice and close. There's lots of those uh, places where you can go collect your rent and the payday money loan stores and stuff. So it just depends on the area and, and there's nothing wrong with either strategy, but there's much better cash flow, um, I think, Net of all this stress, if you value in your time, you value in the stress and you value in the depreciation on the property being much, like you're in a higher depreciation, higher bad debt um, expense because they're not gonna pay the rent on time. Um, you're gonna have a lot more damages and repairs and maintenance. You're gonna have, um, yeah, just stress. Like turnover is typically a little bit higher. All those things you have to factor into your decision. I personally like the A properties better than I like the C or D properties. Most property managers that you're gonna to try to find don't wanna manage the trash properties. So you're gonna have a hard time finding a good property manager. You're gonna have a junkie property manager too who's not gonna do a good job taking care of your property. It's just, you know, the property managers who are okay managing those kinds of tenants and dealing with those people on a daily basis, having to go drive there and pick up cash because they don't have a bank account. Very common in the C and D class tenants. Um, yeah, like that's a different whole, whole different bag of, of you know, marbles than the A or B tenant kind of property. And I think both are fine strategies. You get way more cash flow, but you have way more stress associated with that. And you know, uh, net cash flow some months might be really bad. When you have that tenant turnover, you may go a few months with no money at all. Whereas the A property, when the tenant moves out, you can put a new tenant in, probably with no turnover, no cleanup, no repainting at all. And so you'll have less vacancy. It's just a smoother operation when the, in the A or B properties, and you can just get a higher caliber tenant. And so there's pros and cons to both and both strategies can work really well. It just, it's kind of up to you guys what you know what you feel is the better strategy here for your unique situation. Sound only on the left earbud, right ear, no audio on the YouTube. Definitely not on Facebook, I wouldn't think. I can fix that. Okay. Hey guys on Facebook. See a bunch of people here chilling. Okay. Um, I think we're back on here. Sorry, I have no on Facebook here. Okay, so I'm going to do another question here on Instagram while we try to fix the sound on YouTube. Hello. Okay. I converted my basement into a duplex to rent it out, and it turns out it's not zoned to do that. Do I do it anyways? Yes. Um, I would. My only issue is the water pressure and the sharing the same mailbox. Water pressure, that's an interesting one. Most city water lines coming into any, I don't know where you live, but most cities have like three quarter inch or one inch pipes. And even a half inch line will still have decent water pressure with a second, with another washroom in the basement. Like most houses come with enough water pressure for like two, three, four, five bathrooms pretty easily. They can run laundry and all that kind of stuff at the same time. I've never noticed an issue with water pressure. If your plumber is half decent, they'll know how to put the right you know, valves in and the right water line sizes to ensure you have adequate pressure all of your fixtures. The only time I ever had pressure issues is when I had plumbing issues and I had to redo some of the lines. Um, but we can talk about that another time. So I think, yes, it can make sense to do. If you live in Ontario, the rules from Ottawa are secondary dwelling units, less than or 40% or less of the space of the property are allowed no matter what the zoning is. So you can add a second unit here in Ontario and Canada. Um, put this back up here so you can see me. You can add a second unit if you live in Ontario, no matter what, the municipality has no right to say no, as long as it's 40% less than you can meet building codes for height and egress 
means of escape, etc. What that means is duplexes don't matter. I no longer care. Like duplex versus single family no longer matters. This new ruling from Ottawa allows anyone to have a secondary dwelling unit, as in two units in the property and you can license as such and the municipality cannot stop you. That's valuable to me in that like single family duplex no longer matters. I literally don't care. Any property can be duplexed effectively by the means of secondary dwelling unit. So look into that, new rules from Ottawa, increased affordability, you know, people are trying to have their parents live with them and their kids are staying with them later and et cetera, et cetera, on both ends of the spectrum. It makes more sense to allow secondary dwelling units. So rules from Ottawa pushed in. In London, they, re they refused and they said not in the student areas and that was overturned. It's allowed in any area and now you can do it anywhere in London is my understanding. So yeah, you can just go ahead and do that. Um, secondary dwelling units are allowed, they cannot stop you. Even if they could stop you, who's gonna find out anyway and who cares? open a door up. I put like a like a soundproof door to my basement and my main floor. And I would literally just open that door up when you have the inspector come through. I have a house, two kitchens. I don't know why I keep seeing real estate listings where people it's dumb, but they take the stove out and they're like, Oh, I'm not breaking any rules. Cause I took the stove out. It's like, you're allowed to have two stoves in a house in a single family house. Portuguese and Italian families have two kitchens all the time. Anyway, all you have to do is open the door up. That's it between the units. So use a door that's deadbolt locked and then just open it up when the time comes. I love putting in secondary dwelling units. It's my bread and butter. Hey guys, good to see all you guys on there. Hey yo. You're so smart. Thank you. Uh, continuing this was my agent's idea who didn't check this before I purchased the house and already did all the work then found out. So who cares? Um, you live there, right? You can rent out as rooms if you want. You can rent rooms in your house. No one can stop you from renting out the basement rooms in your house. Inspector comes through, open the door up, right? If there's a wall there, cut in a door. Put a fire rated door and cut it in. Any, any one and a half inch wood door or any of the steel doors, they're great for soundproofing and they solve your issue pretty easily. Where are you from, man? I am from London, Ontario, Canada. And... What's your opinion on the Highbury and King area in London? Um, Tony, Highbury is East London, so it's, it's a rougher area in general until you get really north, like, like Fanshawe Park Road, it gets a little bit nice up there. It's still not as nice as Northwest, but it's nicer there. And then near Fanshawe, there's some like decent areas. And then in the South, there's some slight decent areas. Um, it's okay, like it's an okay neighborhood. It's not an A neighborhood, but it's definitely not like the worst. Okay, I think I've caught up on Insta. Down we go. Oh, I'm missing one question, which I will get to in a second once I switch back from YouTube because I've got to answer all the YouTube questions first. And then I'll go over to Facebook and I'll answer all the Facebook questions, I promise. So stay tuned. Okay, so. This is so zoomed in, I can't even see this. I don't know why it's so zoomed in. Anyway, I'll have to go real close and try to read it. Okay, uh, what's up? Hey, Tiger Rocks, good to see you on. Uh, Michael Chung, Andre, good to see you on as well. Snake Eyes 11, I wonder if the We Buy Homes Cash leaflets work. They do work. Um, I've tried the handwritten notes and I had one success, but I hear they work very well and some of my friends have used them to great success. So they do work. Um, you're gonna get a lot of negative feedback too, so you gotta have thick skin for that, but definitely, um, those types of signs work and you see them on the side of the road sometimes. They're illegal in most municipalities so the city just pulls them after a while but you can put them up and put a burner number attached to them. That's what most of my friends who do that in wholesaling do. Uh, I would do flips until you have enough cash to comfortably do burrs. From my experience it can be way more expensive to fix up a property properly. So Andrew, I actually disagree. Uh, I've never I've never fixed a property up that I wouldn't want to keep. Like I, I would never cut corners on a renovation. It just doesn't make sense to do that. The cost to do things right is almost always a few bucks. I've never found it where like the cost to do it right and the cost to cut corners is like a huge difference. Um, it's always like a couple thousand dollars almost always. Burring is way more efficient way to build wealth. Why? You can pull your money out tax free. When you flip a property personally, you pay 40 something percent tax. Lost, gone. And you have closing costs, realtor fees at 5%, closing costs with legal fees, et cetera, right? There's a lot of costs to sell a property. Why would you bear those costs and slow your trajectory down? Burr it, 
defer the tax until you're a multimillionaire, and then you can go and sell some properties off and deal with the tax consequences once you're wealthy. So my opinion, flipping is not a good business to be in. Flippers get destroyed in times of recession. Burrs, call them burrs, I guess, people who like to burr, they are doing very well in times of recession. They get cash flow, so they can hold. They don't need to sell. They have cash flow from day one. Most of the burrs that I know, what we like to do is like have a unit rented while we rent the, the other one and then switch it. So we have hold, no holding costs. A burr done well is way more efficient than a flip. I've done burrs that produced double what a flip does net. And so the trajectory is much faster. You still own the asset and you got a check for hundred grand. This Saturday's video is gonna explain on my main channel why I think Burr is amazing and why I don't like flipping as much. Um, there are obviously, there, like, and every situation is different. I, flipping is good too. There are times when flipping makes a lot of sense. The velocity of your cash is pretty good. If you can't get a good refinance, it might make sense to flip it. If you can't get a good appraisal value for what you know you can sell it for, sell, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I like Burring's a great way to start building your wealth. Uh, Mike, curious how you maintain a positive attitude throughout and surround yourself with good people. What do you look for and avoid with a business partner or friends? So William, great question. Um, I'm known by no means perfect at keeping positive. I have a lot of days where I'm negative too and uh, down days and it's, it's hard. Like running businesses and being an entrepreneur and you know, managing properties and all the things that I'm doing, it's hard. YouTube and social media is hard. I spend you know, 20 hours on a video and it doesn't do well. That's a hard rejection when you get a lot of comments that are negative sometimes or direct messages that can be negative at times. But there's, I'm mostly surrounded by positive people and positive comments and I think what you put out there you get back and so I try to put out a positive vibe so I can get a positive vibe back. This doesn't make sense to, to be negative. You should try to be positive as much as you possibly can. I was very negative as a, you know, growing up as a kid, a lot of negative experiences and so I've been trying to, to flip my mindset to be more positive and change the, the mindset that I had as a kid and so it's been working okay now. How do you find the right people? Birds of a feather. I think if you operate on that A level, you'll attract A players and then you'll become friends with those people, right? The hedonic treadmill talks about that where basically, you know, the friends you have now are not gonna be the same friends you're gonna have in 20 years most likely if you elevate that next level. If you become like Jeff Bezos, more likely than not, you're, you're gonna have a lot of friends who are also in that same space. And so you just, I guess as you elevate as a person, your friends will elevate with you and it's okay to let friends who maybe uh, they're not the best influence on you. It's okay to spend less time with those people. It's okay to say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't need to spend as much time with this person. They're, they're a bit negative, they're a bit dragging me down. And so I don't say necessarily cut off ties with that family member or that friend, but maybe just distance yourself a little bit and focus on being around the people that have a positive impact on your life. Okay. Um, but uh, Andrew's question about cash to, to burr, I would just borrow the money that I needed to burr. Uh, if you do one burr well, then you get three prop. You go from one property to three properties, right? Because you pull enough down payment for at least one more, maybe two more, and then it just kind of spirals from there. Flipping's a lot slower, I think, to build the capital because you got the tax drag and you got the closing cost drag. But in theory, yeah, no, in theory, a burr actually outperforms a flip if you run the numbers uh, to building net worth. It's faster to build it with a burr. Tiger rocks can't wait, man. Oh, next weekend. Right, right, right. Um, completely forgot about that. It's next weekend. Yeah. So Tagger won the random video comment challenge. So I got 10,000 subscribers. I did a random, just picked a random video and then I just picked a, scrolled down, picked a random comment and they won spang the day. So that's going to be really cool to get that opportunity to, to meet with a subscriber in person. And, and I get a lot of those when I go to events and stuff, but it's always cool to have them come check it out for a day. <clears throat> We're doing another one at 25,000 subscribers. So comment the hell out of my main channel on all the videos. Every time one drops, you gotta like it and then comment on it. And the more times you comment, the more chances that you have to win. And so you get a free day of basically coaching and hanging out and all that kind of stuff with me. Cool story. That'll be fun, I'm actually excited for that. Uh, okay, looking for ideas to find off-market property. Oh, okay, so before you asked a question about how to find off-market deals, um, realtors. Get on Realtors buyers lists. I have a buyers list. If you guys are watching this right now and you haven't emailed me at rosartproperties at gmail.com or on my Instagram or Facebook with your name, your email, maybe your phone number too, that's a mistake. Get on there and do that because I come across pocket listings or agents come across a deal 
they don't want to go through the effort of listing it, especially in a cooler market where like they say, hey, I have a pocket listing. It's an exclusive listing. That's a private deal technically. And you can get, I've got even 15, 20% discounts through pocket listings. Those are private deals. An agent has a deal under contract that hasn't hit realtor.ca yet. And it, you can probably negotiate a bit before it hits the market, no multiple offers, et cetera. In a hot market, it works great. In a cool market, it works even better. You can get in there and lock a property up. It's the best because agents don't know how to price properties very well. I think that a lot of agents are bad at pricing properties and in a cool market, you can negotiate. And if they've mispriced the property, take advantage of that. And uh, that's, that's a great opportunity. I, I'm just thinking of properties I was buying in 2017. Like I bought a six bedroom property, converted it to a six bedroom with two kitchens, kind of nanny suite style for 160 something thousand dollars in London, right near Fanshawe College. They were like 350, right? So that, those are amazing opportunities that when I closed on day one, it was worth 200. So we made like $40,000 on clothes and we renovated it and added some more value to it. That was a pocket listing. Just an agent called me up and said, hey, I have a property. They had three properties, I bought all three of them. And they just wanted an easy solution. They didn't want to have to go through the stress of marketing, all the costs and et cetera. They just wanted a quick close, no conditions. And they knew that I could give that to them. So if you can get in with a lot of realtors, that can be a big one. So join my list. I'm going to be sending out some exclusive stuff. If I come across, I have a lot of wholesalers that bring me deals that maybe I don't want, but are still 20 or 30,000 or 40,000 below market, a decent little flip, you know, not a full burr, a half burr. It's better than full market value. I'll pass those on to you guys and, you know, just share that, those, basically those deals with you. So get on that list and hit me up with that. That'd be good for you guys to get on that list. And yeah, then I have a way to contact you too. It'd be kind of cool to have a way to keep in touch with my subscriber base if, you know, whatever, say, um, you know, some new thing happens in the market and I want to share it. So that's cool. Um, I won't sell your data. Don't worry about that. I'm not selling data or anything like that. It's just have the list. Okay. What questions next? What condition, contingencies do you usually put in your offers? So I think by contingencies, you mean conditions. Um, lately, the market is so hot that you have to put no conditions offers. That is the nature of the market right now where you can't necessarily get away with a financing condition or a building condition, like a building inspection condition. There are like 10 good conditions that I like, 20 good conditions. I had a list of like 50 conditions at one point that were all really cool. Like there was like the silver bullet escalation clause type things to guarantee you win in a multiple offer situation. <clears throat> I've seen some really cool clauses that I've kind of snuck in. At the end of the day, you have, I guess, conditions that are, or what'd you call them there, uh, contingencies. You have contingencies in your offer that can get you out of the deal so you can back out and really only need one. Like it doesn't make sense to put a building inspection and a financing inspection. Always just put one, I'll put like <clears throat> financing condition and that's it. Reason for that, I mean, you can get out, even if there's a building inspection problem, you can just use that one inspection to get out. So why have more than one condition? Put as clean of an offer as you can together to get you the best purchase price. The more contingencies and um, conditions in your offer, the less likely it is to be accepted. I would not want to accept an offer with a lot of conditions. I'd want an offer that was clean and firm, which means no conditions, no contingencies. But you can put conditions in that will help you. For instance, one that I put in all of my offers, this is like probably a thousand dollar pro tip that most agents don't know and most people don't know. It's probably why you want to work with my team. I got a real estate team forming here. So we're going to start helping you buy properties in London area and we'll sell your properties for you in London area. We have a buyer's agent, a seller agent and myself. And we might be bringing on some more people as well to the team. So we'll be able to do a ton of deals and crank stuff out. And I'll be able to show you some of the strategies that will work for me. So if you don't have an agent, hit me up. If you've got a bad agent, hit me up. Um, if you have a good agent, I'm not going to try to poach you from a good agent. But uh, okay, so here's a, here's a good clause that I really like. And we have like no one watching. Four people and like 10 people and like two people. So for the like 16 people that are watching. Um, and all the people that are gonna watch it on the playback, because last week on Facebook, like 900 people watched the playback, which is really cool. Facebook was a new, not a new, an old one, an old place I used to do a lot of videos. I used to do, before I started my YouTube channel, daily vlogs for like 150 days, over six months. Every day I did a video on my Facebook channel, your Facebook page, you can go check that out. It's my personal page. And I did a, a daily vlog, and that was a cool way to get started and you know, sharing what I was doing. That was in like 2017 I was doing that. Um, but yeah, I was kind of sharing on Facebook and going back to that was really cool because I hadn't done a lot of videos on Facebook in a while. So it was a nice, nice way to go back to my roots. But, uh, anyway, so here's the clause, which I've been dragging on, letting you guys know about, and it's a pro tip. Maybe you already know about it, 
but put in your offer the right to review the to walk through the property with 24 hours notice anytime you'd like. So you can get back in the property as many times as you want. That's important because sellers have refused me entry. No, you can't go back in there and meet your contractor to get plans done. No, you can't go in there to show a tenant the property. I put that in all my offers. It doesn't affect the deal. Pretty much no one cares, but it gets me into the property whenever I want. The next best thing I think is that gives you the right to rent the property out before closing. So I'll often put in there like vacant possession and you know, if I can get vacant possession or if it already is vacant, then I can go in there and show the property and have it rented for day of close. I've used before on triplex, got first and last month's rent on all three units before I closed. It was like four, 5% of the down payment because I got the first and last from all the tenants that are going to be moving into this vacant property. So on day of close, I used their rent money to close. No, I had the money set aside to do it, but something you could do and you have no vacancy. Most people wait till close, then they go in and they show the property. If you are, and, and I mean, you've got to have like the time and if you're closing like 10 deals at once, it's obviously impossible to do that. But if you just have one deal closing, you want to spend the time to go market the property, you get in there and show it to your contractors, get a whole plan of attack. So on day of close, you're ready to go. You got it rented already on day one. So that's a cool thing that I try to put in a lot of my offers that'll save you some money and ensure you don't have some vacancy so you can get it rented out before. If the seller's willing to agree to it, it gives you power and control over the property to get in there, you know, in the 60 days before closing or 30 days before closing. And uh, it's a win-win if you can get that first and last before you close. So, okay, let's hit some more questions here. Power sash. Um, I guess, did I answer any of your questions about finding off-market properties? I think we got into a big tangent, but basically they're like door knocking, you know, all the main like private places where people list homes. You can go on all those like Craigslist and things like that. And uh, network is a big one. People who know people who want to sell a house. It's one of the main ways I find private deals, but don't discount the public deals too. There are a lot of MLS deals that are good. Okay. Uh, Mike totally agree about the drama and the entitlement. I talked with extended family about getting a friend to help them go to the doctor. They were like, no, we'll just call an ambulance. They'll do a better job. There you go. So there's the anecdotal um, experience backing up what I've had to say. In my experience, it's, it is tough having the C or D tenants and the C or D properties, a lot more work. I would say five of those properties are the same as like 20 really nice properties from a management perspective. It's a lot more work. So buying those properties, you have five of them. It might feel like you have 10 good properties just because you have bad tenants and 80% of your problems come from 20% of your tenants, unfortunately. Are you legally allowed to disseminate MLS sales data? Snake Eyes 11, I don't know on that. I have to get back to you on that. Um, there was a new ruling in Ontario that we're starting, like people can start sharing data. On the TREB board, there are, there's an app, it's like uh, Sigma, Sigma House, that shares all of the TREB board data of what's sold in your neighborhood. MPAC, if you already own a property, you get an MPAC login, and you can log in and see properties that have sold in your city, in your area. So I used the, my MPAC logins from all my properties to go pull comps before I was an agent. And so I'd, it, I've been able to pull comps since before I was an agent without having to pay for Geo Warehouse for free. Um, now I'm an agent, I can obviously pull anything I need. And I have better data than I had before, but yeah, unfortunately agents are still holding onto the data. They're like, oh, we have this data, and like no one else has it and it gives us value. Honestly, I'm, I'm pro sharing of the data. I think a good agent's value is in the negotiation of the network. Like if you have, an, if you have a network of a thousand buyers, and network of like a thousand investors with deals. If you have inventory in this market, you're a God, right? If you have listings in this market, you're a God. If you have buyers in a cool market, you're a God, right? If you know how to negotiate and facilitate that, no matter what, you'll make money in real estate, I think as an agent. So it comes down to being skilled. The data doesn't necessarily give you an edge and I'm pro sharing of data. I don't know why guys are trying to hold on to the data. I guess there's a lot of privacy laws in Canada and people don't like to know People don't want people to know what they paid for their properties and et cetera, et cetera. Mike, how do you handle snow removal on lawn care? I believe in Ontario, even if you stipulate the tenant is reasonable or responsible for those, you are still legally liable if they slip or get injured. <clears throat> Sorry, this font's super tiny, so I'm having a trouble reading it. But okay, so how do I handle lawn and snow? I mostly make my tenants take care of it. Well, half our properties, we do it. Half our properties, we have the tenants doing it. It's hard in the duplexes and triplexes and the student rentals because they just don't want to do it. In the single families, super easy. How do you do it? You write a separate contract with the tenant and you pay them, say a token amount of $25. And you pay them for that service. And so there's a separate contract that exists. And on the lease, basically uh, 
there, I've heard someone say that you could put in a um, prompt payment discount for the yard grounds being maintained in reasonable order. And so you can have a discount off the rent. You can say, hey, your rent is $1,450 lawfully and I'll, your rent's really $1,400 as long as you keep the grass and the snow up. And so that discount is up to the landlord to determine whether or not it, it uh, should apply or not. What is reasonably good care of the property? I've seen cleaning, I've seen late, uh, not late. You can't do late payments in Ontario, but you can put in the lease prompt payment discount. So if payment is made prompt on the first, then lawful rent is reduced by $25. So you basically just jack your lawful rent up and then you give them a discount for paying on time. That's a legal way to charge a late fee. It holds up the landlord tenant board. Maximum $25. So yeah, there are ways to get around it. Um, separate contract is a great way to do it. You can put it in the new Ontario lease as well, just as a, as a discount and raise the rent effectively. If you were gonna charge 1400, charge 1450 and then give them a discount as such for those services or paying on time or whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, okay, um, what do you think of interest of interest only mortgages. Chuck Norris, <laughs> roundhouse. <laughs> I wish I had, I wish I was as much of a boss as Chuck Norris. You guys remember all those memes that used to pop, float around like the 90s and 2000s? All the Chuck Norris jokes. Like if you played World of Warcraft, it was like every Chuck Norris joke. Um, yeah, there you go. There's like a million of them. Um, mortgage only interest, uh, or interest only mortgages. They're great. Lower cash flow, or way greater cash flow than if you had a mortgage, they had to pay principal repayments. I don't like to pay down my mortgages. I refinance them if I start paying them down, right? As, as they get paid down, I refinance them, pull the money out and buy another property. So you guys know I'm pro um, interest only mortgages because better cash flow. and why would you wanna pay on your mortgage anyway? Um, just take the money and save it. it. If you're a bad saver and you, don't, you can't delay gratification and pay yourself first and you can't save that money, um, I think that the mortgage forces you to save. And so that's where like, the average Canadian's probably better off with a mortgage that has principal payments. But I think for the astute, good saver, real estate investor that is good with their money, interest only mortgages, way better. Okay, next. Um, sounds fine now, cool. What's your take on real estate hedge funds like Cardone's? Do you ever see yourself creating one in the long run? Robert Morrissey, great question. Um, yeah, I think that the funds are great because they're they're easy to access. So if you have like 10 grand, you put it in a REIT, like real estate investment trust or some sort of fund as such, and you just get a, like, a nice low return. It's worse than private lending. You get a lower return than private lending, but it's publicly traded, it's pretty liquid, and you get a decent return. It's okay, like you know, eight, 10% returns, pretty standard. In a down market, the Cardone fund, I'm sure will have very little performance, um, maybe even negative, but uh, yeah, I, you're better off buying real estate in my opinion or investing in someone who's doing real estate investing on a small time basis because Cardone Capital takes a ton in fees. And like for instance, here in Canada, if you are trying to start a fund, you have to become securities commission compliant, right? So you have to get a memorandum and have a, like a legal team. It costs about $200,000 a year just in like overhead costs to keep it going. You as the investor in that fund are paying that fee and you're paying the management fee, and you're paying et cetera, et cetera fees. In theory, they should have more economies of scale because they're managing a huge portfolio. So I'm sort of, I like the real estate funds better than I like, say, like high growth stock or like more risky type equity investments, but I like it less than going and finding a joint venture partner and investing with them. The thing is this, a lot of joint venture partners that I'm meeting at networking events haven't done a lot of deals. They've done like three deals. And some of those people, aren't experts and they may give you worse performance than you would have had in a fund. So just be careful. I'm kind of neutral on it. Um, I don't have any money in those types of funds because I know I can do better with my money, but for the noob investor who doesn't want to do any work, it's a decent option, especially if you don't know anyone you can private lend to. Good question. Okay, next we've got, hey Mike, what do you think is a good amount of cash to start burring with? For example, 50% down, 50K down payment and 10K for renovations. So ten, Daniel, good question. Um, it depends on the deal. So you need, typically when you're burring, I think the, the best way to burr, never, I'm gonna say this, never put less than 20% down on a burr. Do not pay the private mortgage insurance, it will kill your burr. When you go on, the idea of a burr is you buy, you reno, you rent it out, and then you um, refinance it, right? And you repeat the strategy. So if you're going back to refinance, you can only ever refinance 80% loan to new value, appraised value. 
So the benefit that the five or 10 or 20, 15% down gave you is completely gone after the refinance. So never do a burr less than 20% down. Like just don't do it. It's not a burr. You'll get destroyed in the fees. And we can argue about that in the comments. I'm right. I've done the numbers on this. I'm happy to have the debate. I've had it like eight times now and every single time the person's like, oh, I didn't know that. Or like, oh, I made that mistake. I won't make that mistake again. Anyway, if you've done it, it's okay. Don't do it again. 20% down. So if you bought, if you were in a town that had a house price of like $100,000 and the ARV was say $180,000, you could go in like the lower end of your market and find a cheap house. In London, they exist. I bought houses here in the last year. I bought a single family detached house in East London for $125,000. And it was a, it was a full bar, 125,000. We spent like seven, 7,000 on rentals, I think 8,000. I can't remember exactly, but very small rental. We just added a bathroom and cleaned up some flooring and paint. Um, very, very small reno. And, uh, it just, the plumbing worked out really nice. It was easy to do. And, uh, I think it refinanced 185 is the current value. 185, 190 is current value. So that's a full burr. And down payment would have been like 20% on 120 grand or even hundred grand is $20,000. So 20, 30,000. And then you had, you know, carrying costs, what was vacant while you're renovating it. Plus, you know, renovation budget, you might be in for 10 or 20,000. You can get away with 40 or $50,000 and do a burr. Now, if you're in a market where you want to be more in the, in the A areas, like in the A areas of London, you need to be spending three, four, $500,000 to get the nicer properties. It's hard to find those hundred thousand dollar deals. They exist, but they're harder to find. Um, you can do it with a lot, you can do it with 20 or 30 or $40,000 or 50,000, but I think a, a proper burr, we're making good profits. Like you need a good hundred grand. You, you can do it. Start small, find a small burr that has a small purchase price and a good ARV spread. Okay. Good question. The next question is Mike, what are you levered up and trying to get several projects wrapped up? Oh. Mike, when are you levered up and trying to get several projects wrapped up? Any tips on the best way to wrap things up? Life is sucking right now, but end is in sight. I beam with permits being worked now. Okay, so I had a hard time reading that, but I effectively understood that you're saying um, when you're all levered up, it's really tough. You get cash strapped. That is, it sucks. Um, so when you're cash strapped, what do you do? Don't put yourself in that position. <laughs> Um, maybe you could borrow some money to give yourself some liquidity. Maybe you can go to a line of credit from the bank or get a, you know, an MBNA 0% credit card and go get $10,000, 0% interest on that card to give you a bit of buffer room. It's stressful. Like when you're levered out and you've got a bunch of projects on the go, it's a lot. Like I've been under that intense amount of stress for like a year straight where we've got like 10 projects on the go and I'm overwhelmed all the time. It sucks. But you have to keep a, an eye on the future and say like, Hey, is this going to be worth it in the end? And the answer is yes. Then then do that. Um, it's funny. I was watching a video a year ago of myself and it's funny. I did the real estate snowball. And I talked about getting zero to 10 properties in under three years. And then I talked about the strategy works to get zero to 50 properties. And someone actually challenged me on that and said like, could you actually do that? And I've done that now. So I should make a video on zero to 50 properties in a year. That'd probably be pretty clickbaity and start with that comment. That person sent me that said like, Hey, it's not possible. You can't do zero to 50 in a year. It's just, it, you can't do, find that many birds. It just can't be done just prove to them that it's doable. But uh, that's one of my favorite things, by the way, is when someone says, Hey Mike, you can't do that. And I go and do it. It's my favorite. It's like, Mike, you can't, you can't get this done. And I go and do it. It's like, Oh shit. They're eating their words. Um, just, you know, you got, you got to find out what works for you. And I think for me, there are certain strategies that help me de-stress at the end of the night. And, and that's key. Um, you'll get through it. It, it does pay off in the end. Um, don't put yourself in that position next time. <laughs> Hopefully you get through it, William. And I'm here to support and, and I know that in the end, you're going to be happy that you did it and all those birds are going to pay off. Thanks for commenting. Hey, uh, it says, how long did a burr reno take when you first started? It took me like seven months or eight months to finish my first renovation, but I did a lot of the work myself and I just dragged it out in the learning process. So it takes longer. You know, I've seen people do flips themselves that take a year. And so, so kind of factor that in. It can take up to a year to flip a property if you don't have a good crew of people going. And in a hot market, it's hard to get good crews. Eric, good to see you on. Hi. Hi, Mike. How long, how do you get loans in you don't have W-2 income? Okay, so Benjamin, 
uh, that's in the US. I think it's like T4 income in Canada. So if you don't have income, it's harder to get loans for sure. I have income sources, but I don't have two years of established entrepreneurial um, sources of income. You need two years of financial statements as an entrepreneur to get financing. Even if you're a real estate agent, they don't like to see that you've only doing, it's not really technically an employment. It's more like an entrepreneurial venture with risk. So how do you do it? Net worth lending. I have a high net worth, so I still get mortgages. Um, credit unions lend on net worth. My real estate portfolio also cash flows very well, and some lenders will take a look at that. It is hard for me to get a lender financing, no doubt about it. The only way I get a lender financing from the big banks is by doing net worth programs. They have a program where if you snapshot a certain amount of liquidity and you have a certain high net worth, they will still lend to you. So that's how I get financing right now. And then there's obviously the B and the C market. So B lenders are more flexible. They'll charge you five, 6% interest, but maybe even 7%, but they're more flexible on the income requirements. They might say, hey, he's a wealthy guy. He's got a good portfolio. We'll take the risk on him. And credit unions love real estate investors that are full-time. They consider it like a small business. And so they give you small business loans like 4%. So you can still get financing, no problem. All good questions here. Okay, next one, we're gonna power through. Do you get, hang on a minute. Try to zoom into this one. Do you get individual contractors or how general contractors do everything? you do the reno before closing. Chuck, no, you can never renovate a property before close. If something happens at the property, no. Um, liability is a huge risk. Um, don't do it. I don't think you're even legally allowed. I once was told by a seller, he's like, go ahead and start renovating. You know, you can close that next month. I don't mind. What would happen if like the deal fell apart and he kept all the renovations I did? Never renovate before the, before the close of the property. Don't do it. Uh, but great question. Something you might've thought of. You think I can rent the property out before I close. Maybe I could renovate it, but uh, good question. Mike, thank you for the restaurant challenge. Really has changed my eating habits. Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad that you took the 30 day no restaurant challenge. Remember bath time. I'm signing off for early tonight. Have a good week. Thanks William. Appreciate you jumping in. And yes, bath time for me, family time. Family is number one. Uh, okay, Robert says, Mike, any good books on real estate you need? or read, you've read. Sorry, that font is so small and hard to read. Uh, I'm trying to think. I haven't read any good real estate investing books recently, but when I started investing in real estate, I would read like the Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad kind of stuff. Um, Bigger Pockets, I love their blog posts. I actually just didn't read a lot of books. I found everything that I needed on YouTube and on blogs. And I'd read a lot of blogs written by good real estate investors. Bigger Pockets is my favorite. They have a ton of great articles. Uh, so check those guys out at biggerpockets.com. Maybe someday I'll get on their podcast. Thanks for the answer. No problem. Is hiring a general contractor worth it? Do you buy the materials? Um, I guess I didn't really answer that question. Um, I have a guy that is a project manager for us and they help manage the project with me and they manage the sub trades. I think it's more efficient to bring the sub trades in and have a guy who's doing the work, then I've always found the general contractor would be like making 40 bucks an hour and he's just watching two other guys work. And so it's never been really efficient. I've always found those quotes to be really high. But the guys who are just like a general contractor are always charging 40 or 50,000 to finish a basement that I can do for 20. If I just brought a guy in who's gonna do the work, I'm like, hey, I'll give you 20 grand to do this work. So I've always went direct to the sub trades, much preferred that. I like an everything guy the most, but sometimes plumbing and stuff like that, I'll have to, you'll have to outsource to a specific guy who, has the expertise on that. So Jonas says, keep crushing it. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna go over to Instagram, hit that. No, Facebook. Hey guys, hey Brock, hey Elle, hey Don. And there's a comment here. Hey, hey Tayama Lee. Is purchasing power of sale homes or condemned as is homes a good idea? It depends. Uh, sometimes you can get really good discounts. Sometimes you have to overpay for the asset, especially in this market right now. People think they can get renovations done for 50 or 60,000. They overpay and they price out their profit. You gotta be careful when people start pricing out their profit. Okay. Um, there are a lot of issues, a lot of stress. The second part of your question, are there a lot of issues? Yes, there's a lot of stress associated with buying those types of properties. You gotta be careful. You gotta be, have the expertise, I think, to execute on that. Higher power. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, you just pull my chain. And I went and took it a serious way. 
and said, hey, you know what? You guys might as well believe in God. Like straight up, what is the downside of believing in a higher power? Like whether you're right or you're wrong, you benefit by believing in it. I don't know, my two cents. Like if you're wrong and heaven does exist, I mean, you believe in it, so you get to go to heaven. You practice all the things. If you're wrong, if you were right, you know, the whole time or whatever, either way you win, right? You're, you're either winning or you're winning. Good question. Your good comment there. Jeremy, good to see you. Okay, scrolling. So, uh, Kwame Jimmy says, do you have Airbnb properties? Yes, I do. Not very many. Uh, I see it as a big trend now, seeing most of your colleagues are engaged in it. So, yeah, they're using Airbnb. Um, Airbnb is just like another business. It's like a hospitality type business. Yeah, I mean... There are tons of courses and, you know, Jeff and Matt have their Airbnb mastermind course. I think you could, on the topic of courses, I think you could probably learn everything you need to learn by talking to people who are doing it and you get that information for free. So I've never bought a course on it. I just kind of muddled through figuring out Airbnb and like I, you can get 900 or a thousand bucks for a bedroom. It's a lot of extra work. So I don't like Airbnb because the extra work associated, um, it also turns your property into a commercial property if you have enough Airbnb income. That's an issue for resale. You need the HST on the sale of the property. So there are some downsides to Airbnb. There are some pros. You gotta weigh those and decide whether it makes sense. For me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I get great cap. I do furnished rentals that get almost the same amount of rent as Airbnb for none of the cleaning fee, none of the damages or the stress. So you gotta factor it in. How much, like do you wanna just squeeze one orange till it's like bone dry and get the most juice out of it? Or are you okay having like 10 oranges that are like decently squeezed? I'd rather just have 10 oranges that are decently squeezed and use my time more effectively. I'm not hugely Airbnb pro. I have, we have done some Airbnb management. We have it done it on our own properties. I like Airbnb. It's nice because you don't have the tenant eviction stuff. It comes with its own set of problems too. There is no like one best real estate investing strategy except the Burr probably. That one has the highest return on investment. You can get several hundred percent return on your money. But yeah, um, nothing against like Airbnb. It's great. Kyle's have a great experience with it. I've had great experience with it. Everyone I know that's doing it is having great experience with it. They've got horror stories too, but you got to factor in that, you know, to make money, you have to deal with the problems. It's more work, admittedly, to do Airbnb. Okay, scroll down here. Uh, okay, Mike, you look like an intelligent investor. Thank you. And Fraz, thank you for the comment. What's that? I can argue it's less work for Airbnb. Okay, maybe so Kyle might argue that it's less work for Airbnb. I kind of, uh, turnover's been the biggest problem for me that, that I found. I just like putting a tenant in and not have to worry about it for three years. They pay the rent automatically and there's nothing happens. That's true. That's the but ideal. It's, but it's taken me 10 years to get a decent roommate who actually upholds the standard of living that I like in my house. Right. So if you had two people, that increases your chances by 50% of having another shitty roommate. Potentially, yeah. Right? And if I have a shitty roommate and a good roommate, that's a lot more work. Do you prefer the, the turnover though? Like having to make the beds and do the cleaning and... It's almost nothing. Yeah. If you're doing it on a bigger scale, and it's a lot. Anything, a bigger scale, yes. Like when, I, when we were doing a lot of units, it was a lot of work. And I'm like... 100%. I'm like the amount of time it takes me to manage a portfolio of 10 properties yeah. is like a couple hours. Like yeah. not that much, but a 10 properties on Airbnb, it's a lot. I'm going to all the properties. They're calling me like, oh, this tap doesn't work. If you're living there, if you're living in the Airbnb, I think it's way better. Yeah. Like I should probably Airbnb, like it would actually be a good idea if I had a spare room to Airbnb in my room. Yeah. The problem is you have to deal with like building the ads and there's a lot of upfront time to staging it and all that. Once you've got it set up, I think the Airbnb is not as much work, but the upfront capital and time is more. Yeah. So it's kind of, yeah. 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 Comparing it to a, yeah, in a, in a separate building, yeah, it's definitely a different story, but at least, in comparison to living in your Oops. own unit and having a roommate, I think it's, I would argue that it's really not that much more work. Than right. Having, so then having oh, just... I have a minute left on Instagram before it turns off. <laughs> 50 seconds. Okay, we're into power mode. It's going to just turn off for some reason. I don't know why that is, but it's turning off. Um, lives. They must cap their lives. Yeah. Okay, so thank you everyone for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the comments. Jeremy, I saw your question. I'll answer it on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, I agree. I believe in God too. There you go. D's information. There's no downside to living in God. Like it just doesn't hurt you in any way. Keep crushing. Thank you. 
Uh, Mike, generally real estate is high volatility. Uh, yes, correct. And I'll answer those questions in the comments. I'll see you guys all in the comments. Thank you all for watching. I gotta go do bath time. It is 8.17 and uh, yes, definitely you have to factor in Robert volatility in your decision of what to invest in. Thank you all for watching. And if I missed your comment, send me a DM and I'll see you guys all on my Instagram stories in the comments on the channel and I'll see you this Saturday. Please like that video. It'd mean a lot to me if you like and watch it all the way through when it drops Saturday at noon. Thank you all so much. Bye guys. Spend less, earn more, maximize your returns. Okay, that one's off. Now we're over here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I gotta end all these things here. What factors go into deciding a duplex or a student rental? Um, I like to duplex anyway, because you get more rent. Um, I guess rents and cost are the two big factors for me. And yeah, do you worry much about outside work being done before you do a refi on your burr? Uh, I always do curb appeal, really important. So definitely do the outside work before you finish your burr. Curb appeal is really important. Uh, at least it's five minutes, so I gotta go. Um, work time, cost, cash flow. Jonas, exactly, hit the, the nail on the head. You gotta factor in the costs, which could be time input or money input, and then factor in what money you can get out. It's just a financial decision at the end of the day. And yes, you gotta run your numbers. Like, you know, if you have to sacrifice a sixth bedroom to put an extra kitchen in to make it a duplex, is a six bedroom rental better or a five bedroom duplex? Run the numbers. Sometimes it's better the duplex rents for more and you know, one bedroom unit rents for 900 and you get more rent than if you had two bedrooms down there. So it just, run your numbers, what are you comfortable with? And at the end of the day, it, you can still do a student duplex too. So student, they're not mutually exclusive in that a student property could also be a student duplex. Most of my student properties are duplexes and triplexes and stuff like that too. So yeah, cool. I'll see you guys all next week. Spend less, earn more, and maximize your returns. Bye. Thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it so much. I'll see you Saturday in the main channel in the comments.